Thank you, my friend. Okay, we're we're gonna we're, we're gonna get going. We have a group of people in the room. You can only see me at the moment uh, for the event, uh, but you will be introduced uh, in just a moment to uh, the um, other participants in the second half of the event today. Um, this is um, for those of you who have any doubt about what you've zoomed into at this moment. Uh, the uh, event that has been organized at the University of Illinois and through the Institute of Communications Research in the College of Media, uh, titled uh, James Carey and Media Studies, the Past and the Present. Um, I had, uh, unbeknownst to me, muted myself yesterday uh, afternoon. Uh, and so I need to repeat a couple of things before I introduce uh, our first speaker. Uh, this event was in many respects prompted by um, the new, uh, two years ago, new James Carey Faculty Fellowship for faculty in the College of Media at the University of Illinois. And I was one of two recipients in the first year of that. And in my application for uh, that fellowship, uh, I noted to the review committee that I did not intend to use uh, the funds that I would receive for research purposes uh, explicitly, but rather uh, to stage a colloquium that in part was intended to call attention uh, to this brand new James Carey Faculty Fellowship uh, in the College of media. Uh, so I've settled with the title, um, James Carey and Media Studies, the Past and the Present, uh, because in part, I'm interested in using uh, this event, this platform, this venue as a way of thinking about media studies in the past and the present, as well as uh, the legacy of James Carey, but also uh, what needs to be revisited and perhaps even rethought uh, about uh, James Carey's work in the 20th century and its relation to current directions uh, of media studies in 2023. Um, I'm also, uh, in terms of inviting uh, in a relatively small scale colloquium, albeit uh, on two different days, uh, attempting to represent uh, some of the many uh, interests that Jim had uh, in his writing, uh, in his teaching, uh, in his administration. Uh, and they are, I mean, one of the features and one of the things that I've sort of most um, and still feel connected to him about is just the sort of robustness of his uh, interests. Uh, and anyone who heard him speak, or even those of you who didn't and who've read him uh, are aware of uh, his many interests. And so I've tried in inviting speakers uh, for yesterday's meeting and today's to represent uh, that range, although it's not in any way uh, comprehensive. Uh, and also just to, in some ways, recognize his, the broad range of interests as an administrator on this campus. Uh, he was, for a period of time, the Dean of the College of Communication, which has now been rebranded in the 21st century as the College of Media. And he was also, for a while, the Director of the Institute of Communications Research. Uh, but I think that he was part of a formation of administration on this campus uh, that has changed quite a lot, not only on this campus, but at universities in the world, at public universities in the United States. So the point that I simply want to make is that while he was an administrator of a college of communication and media, he was very interested in interdisciplinary curricula for undergraduates and graduate students uh, who were training uh, in journalism, in advertising, uh, 
and other areas of communication studies. Um, so uh, lastly, I want to call attention because this is my lead into my introduction of the speakers for today, uh, why and how history and historiographies uh, matter. Uh, I think of Jim not only as a media and communication historian, but he was a historian in many respects, and he clearly valued the importance of uh, a kind of historical reflexivity uh, in doing any kind of research uh, on communication or media, whether it was empirical work or whether it was uh, critical political economic work or whether it was critical cultural studies uh, approaches to media and communication. Uh, so uh, I have toyed uh, with the idea of titling this two-day event as a kind of uh, seance, uh, playfully referring to uh, the way in which um, mediums, as the term gets used in reference to seances, uh, have to do with messages, uh, but uh, also of thinking about uh, communication, uh, establishing a medium, if you will, with the past and the present, with the living and with the dead. Uh, so on that note, I want to introduce uh, our first speaker today, Jeff Pooley, uh, who has written a book uh, about uh, Jim, the arc of Jim's career, and I wanted to include him in our conversation this weekend. So without further introduction, if Jeff wants to introduce himself, I'm gonna let him do that because he can do that a lot better than I can. Thank you, Jeff. Um, all right, thank you, James. I am going to share the screen here in a moment. Let me just pull up the browser and attempt to share the screen. Bear with me for a moment. Okay, that should work. Okay, uh, so it's kind of odd to be looking at you all in this camera at the same time, but uh, James, thank you for organizing this event and for inviting all of us. And uh, I am honored to be here. Uh, I have a talk that is based on a kind of Follow up to the book project that I that James referenced, um, and what I'm especially interested in, if I can get this to work, is to think about this storyline that Jim Carrey put together over his career about the Chicago School of Sociology in particular, and it was peculiar. It differed from the many many other Chicago School um, renditions that. Um, are out there. Everyone, I think it was uh, Andy Abbott said, everyone has their own private Chicago. Uh, his Chicago was really the um, combination of John Dewey in most renditions, uh, uh, Charles Horton Cooley and Robert Park. And this is a kind of an idiosyncratic, but very influential within media and communication studies rendition of what the Chicago school was. Though Dewey wasn't, um, he was a philosopher, of course, and Cooley wasn't at Chicago. Park, however, um, was the center of the story. And what I want to test out a little bit today, it's really more of a foray into a, um, an alternative story, one that is about the Chicago school, but that is um, focused on Park and the department itself and the interwar sociology department at Chicago. And in particular, I want to talk about this collective behavior tradition that Park pioneered. Um, and Park put under this um, umbrella term a variety of different social phenomena like crowds, social movements, um, religious sex, um, public opinion, rumor, fashion. They were all kind of extra institutional formations. Um, like the softer cake uh, in a way of society. And his argument way back to his um, German language dissertation was that collective behavior formations like these were not merely disruptive, um, but they're also generative of new institutions um, and social solidarities. It was a kind of theory of social change and, and so social continuity. And this version of his 
Well, th this collective behavior idea was steeped in media and, and their audiences from the beginning. So the story of Robert Park, um, right? I mean, in his renditions over the decades, newspapers, radio, and their audiences um, partake in both sides of that. They unsettle existing orders and they help rebuild new ones. And uh, the punchline of my story today is that over the post-World War II decades, this collective behavior tradition um, was severed. It was, was um, you could say, cleansed of its media focus, which was adopted more or less by communication and media research. And within sociology, um, the, social, the study of social movements took its place and collective behavior and uh, social movements was indeed the name of the American Sociological Association division that um, was founded in 1980, but was already thriving uh, in the previous decade. So the mystery is in a way that, um, why is this tradition that was pioneered by Park um, so steeped in media, why did it lose that character over time? And in a way, this is a um, continuation of a project that is trying to consider why, if it did at all, which is an open and fair question to ask, why American sociology abandoned mass communication research in the 1950s and 1960s, especially by the 60s. And it's something, a project that I've been thinking about for a while in this specific um, collective behavior strand is one that L.U. Katz and Deb Lubkin, a, um, a, a Annenberg graduate, had worked on um, a few years ago, and I'm sort of picking up the thread from, from that project. And so the question is, how did this happen? How did the um, collective behavior tradition get its media focus um, severed? And what I want to do is just um, back up and suggest, well, first that there are a couple of motiva motivations. The first is just this mystery about the, um, you know, the, the mass communication abandonment question. But the second one is a motivation that's not unlike Jim Carrey's when he was thinking about the Chicago School. He presented the Chicago School and that trio of figures I mentioned as a, a kind of totem for interpretive humanism as a sort of you know, usable past of a humanist kind. And here I'm suggesting that maybe this collective behavior tradition has something parallel to say that might be interesting um, if it was reunited with the study of media in the sense of embedding the study of media in a theory of social change and continuity that this um, collective behavior tradition represents. So why did it happen? I have three sort of guesses, three explanations, um, and they overlap, and uh, I haven't teased them out exactly. Um, the first one is sort of boring, and maybe boring because it's been talked about so much, but it's the idea that um, these new programs like the one founded here by Wilbur Schramm, um, uh, you know, suck the oxygen out of the room. In other words, like took the study of media away from sociology in the 1950s as Schramm and his allies marched through the journalism schools and, um, you know, claimed students, claimed faculty and the rest. There's some truth to that, I think. There's also a story that I think is important inside sociology itself, the, the extraordinary growth of sociology in the 1960s, especially with the, the US University expanding dramatically at the time. And Chicago in particular as a space had been amazingly dominant in the production of PhDs. Like it produced almost half of all PhDs in sociology before the World War II, and it had become a relatively small part of the discipline. Um, and then, you know, quite crucially in the mid to late 60s, the um, rise of, of the student left and, and social movements and the self emulation of some of those movements led lots of former radicals to enter graduate school and study uh, that. that um, period and the social movements that were under uh, um, that that were um, animating it and the study of social movements in particular displaced media in one way is one way to put the chief claim that I want to make. The result, I would argue, is that this collective behavior tradition was split um, within sociology. The tradition had media excised and communication scholarship, for its part, was not aware of its sort of partial inheritance. In effect, communication and collective behavior, I wanna say, went their separate ways. Um, okay, so uh, there is a third argument I wanna make, and it is about this, I think it's the most interesting actually, because it's internal to Chicago itself. It's about Herbert Bloomer, the figure represented here, 
and his uh, symbolic interactionist approach, he was Park's heir apparent for collective behavior. He was the one who got the class um, when Park retired in 1934. He was always a reluctant champion of this tradition. Um, and it was in these exact years that he was moving to codify what he was starting to call in the uh, late 1930s, symbolic interactionism. And it was in effect a kind of alternative to collective behavior, it was defined against it in some extent, to some extent. And you could say in a way that he swapped Mead for Park. Um, he adopted in this period kind of um, George Herbert Mead as his lodestar and broke that tradition in a way I wanna get at. Okay, so that's sort of the preview. I'm gonna move through quickly, but those th three arguments. First, just Robert Park, I, I know many of us have a sense of his background. Um, he studied with um, Dewey at Michigan in the 1880s and was um, motivated from that experience, already interested in the newspaper and the public um, and to be, be a reporter for over a decade, uh, went to Harvard and didn't find the study of the press uh, and uh, there, although I had some excellent teachers who recommended he go to Germany where he had a little stint with Zimmel and ended up doing his PhD under uh, Wilhelm Wendel. Windelband, if I'm not I'm mispronouncing that, and had this um, remarkable, um, very strange dissertation um, uh, that, that only got translated into English, it's Mass on Publicum, um, in 1972, but it was in the 1904 period, and it's a very odd book, but you can see the basic gist of his argument um, in, this, in this dissertation. Um, it's very, um, it's like a neo-Kantian high formalism. He's treating the public in the crowd, for example, which he takes from Tart, but not in any way historically. Like these are timeless universal categories um, that in, in, this, in this version are meant to establish a special space for sociology, like a, the study of social life. And the, and the crowd and the public are two of those domains. Even though it's quite different from what he would later elaborate, it did have the core point um, about social unrest not being merely anarchy, um, but being the seeds of a new social order. Like that core claim was already there. Um, he's, uh, and he did use um, Tard and the French and uh, Italian social psychology of the crowd, though he was less like less of that like stuttering disdain for, um, for, for the, the crowd than, than some of those figures expressed. The, uh, he ended up spending 10 years, as many folks know, with Booker T. Washington at the Tuskegee Institute and was brought to the University of Chicago in the teens, um, first to do a little teaching by W.I. Thomas. He was teaching classes on the crowd and the public. And he used in a, in a 1915 essay, the very first one he published on the city, it's quite, quite famous, he used this phrase, a more detailed or more intimate study of what may be called in order to distinguish it from that of more highly organized groups, collective behavior. Uh, and by the time the, the so-called Green Bible was published with his colleague, Ernest Burgess, he was by that time um, full-time and at the center of the department, um, Thomas having left, the Green Bible, this 1000 page um, rambling, remarkable uh, book um, is fascinating for a lot of reasons, but it's utterly underwritten by this idea of collective behavior. That's the through line. Sociology is so far as it can be regarded as a fundamental science. This is kind of funny in the boundary work going on, but not mere conjuries of social welfare programs and practices may be described as the science of collective behavior. Um, and, you know, he goes on to draw on Dewey and Tard and, and, Tard and also in interesting ways, um, Durkheim. But he does develop that point that he had made in the original dissertation about the public and the crowd, but now in more historical terms. Um, human society, he writes, is mainly a social heritage created in and transmitted by communication. Now, Park himself was um, enigmatic and brilliant, a, a deeply influential teacher. His main influence, many people have argued, is through his doctoral dissertation advising, you know, um, which is absolutely remarkable. And he was, um, didn't publish much, he was a pained writer. Um, the, so he struggled to articulate this. One exception was this great 1922 book on the immigrant press, um, which he described um, immigrant groups with their foreign press or their foreign language press, I should say, be, uh, being nevertheless Americanization by contact. And it was a, a sort of collective behavior oriented study, um, attempting to, in other words, bring together the cycles of of, of, of 
regeneration and degeneration. Um, he, he continued to write about collective behavior over the uh, 1920s in a number of articles um, referring to communication um, and its binding power. Um, but with this special attention to extra institutional group formations, whose dynamism powers these cycles of decay and growth. By 19, this is his 1938 piece. He had already retired to go to Fisk and his heir apparent, as I already kind of hinted, um, and here's the opening to this 1938 piece is brilliant. Communication is so obvious and pervasive a factor in social life that I have often wondered why so little has been said or written about it. Now that I have attempted to write something on the subject, I no longer wonder, I know. <laughs> it's a, it's a, a, a brilliant essay. Um, uh, but at this point, um, Bloomer comes into the story. And this is the third of those three explanations I mentioned at the top. And again, the one that I think is the most interesting and it needs a lot of fleshing out. Um, but as I said, he was this reluctant champion. Um, Park drafted him to write the chapter on collective behavior in this edited volume from 1939 that Park edited. And and, and Bloomer did, um, his approach, and I just for time reasons can't go into it, was like highly taxonomic. The media itself is notably absent. And when it is there, it's it's um, treated in a very different way. Um, and I guess I just, in the interest of time, I am watching the clock, want to point out again, that this was the period when he had basically adopted George Herbert Mead. Um, he was, uh, beginning to call his work symbolic interactionism or his name for the sort of theory of social subjectivity that he read off of Mead. Um, and he was like Park, a pained writer. Um, and he didn't really codify this work until many decades later in 1969 in, in this symbolic interactionism, which gave birth to a, like a vibrant subfield of sociology, but one that was micro sociological. And <clears throat> even back in the 1930s, Bloomer was already prickly and demanding in his methodological program, which was centered on close attention to the meanings that people ascribe to others in their midst. And while it was possible in theory to use this approach to study larger formations like audiences or even institutions, um, in practice, it didn't scale. Um, and this was for Bloomer a pretty big turnabout. He had even in, earlier in the decade been studying uh, movies, for example, in a collective behavior framework. But by this 19, late 1930s period, he was defining his new approach, interpretive interaction is another phrase he used against the collective behavior tradition. So he, in effect, substituted need for Park and um, went on in the post-war decades to be this critic of the mainstream variable sociology in a series of like high profile like biting essays you know one of the last one in 56 was a um asa presidential address just attacking lazarsfeld attacking a lot of the figures that we associate with that mid-century communication research world and in a 1959 piece he basically sa says it's impossible to study media i mean to do it right like to do it right would be so hard that you can't do it um and i mentioned that partly because i do think that he cut off in a way some of the tradition at Chicago, at least the media focus on, on of collective behavior in part by substituting this median alternative. It's true that after the war in the 50s, there were students of his, Everett Hughes, Tomatsu uh, Shibutani, um, who, who uh, were writing about collective behavior. There's a Ralph Turner textbook from 1957 with another um, Chicago graduate, um, this Shibutani well-known book. Um, you have the Langs themselves writing in this tradition and including media and all of these books still in 1950s, they still talk about the uh, mass media as multiple chapters in these books. Um, however, uh, you know, so just as an example, here's, you know, in that one, you see mass society and mass communication and, and a series of related chapter titles. So that first explanation, I don't want to linger on because I've talked about it elsewhere, the idea of Shran marching through and sucking up the oxygen. Um, I think one of the reasons why you see this drop off in media it, within the collective behavior tradition is the fact that though, that, you know, that the media has been claimed or mass communication has been claimed by journalism schools. And just to like, give a slightly different spin on it, I tried to look through the pretty plentiful series of self-studies that sociologists have done and have done through the decades about their own fields approaches. And for example, this is um, like the a a ASR and AJS topical areas. And 
you can see that communication, you might not be able to see, it's pretty tiny, but um, communications and public opinion in 1940 were relatively underrepresented, but were almost exclusively, you know, they were nearly gone in 1965 and 1966 over that 15 year period. A series of other similar kinds of stories. I know this is hard to read from where you are, but you know, um, another attempt to, to look at the journal articles in, in this case, the AJS, um, you know, it, it, it reached a high point in the 1920s and 30s and declined thereafter until a uptick in 1970s. You know, there are a series of other ways to look at this, like here's the ASR articles and you can see a decline from the 50s to the late 50s, which sort of provides some like tentative, not very good evidence of, of a drop off in interest in mass communication. Um, this is even harder to see. Um, sometimes collective behavior and mass communication were bundled together. And this is from 1970, um, that it was 1.8% of the respondents asked about their area of specialization. I know I'm going super fast here. Apologize, I'm getting very close. But by the, you know, this is a look at the job markets in sociology, department vacancies in that period, and communication just isn't even on there. Um, it's not, um, it's, it doesn't even appear in the tables. And you know, there, there are, this doesn't stand as like proof that communication had dropped out. There's a kind of sociology of labeling going on and very complicated process for sure. But I do think it's like suggestive and interesting evidence in these and similar studies about the drop off of interest in media. Either way, now I'm moving on to the second of three, or really no, the third of three, as it turns out, um, uh, explanations for this drop off. I do think that the extraordinary growth in American sociology in this period mattered a lot, in particular because Chicago itself had been such a, uh, not just like an intellectual center, but actual center in percentage terms of the number of PhDs being produced, um, uh, had its scope diminished dramatically just because of the uh, you know extraordinary increase in the number of PhDs in this period. Here is a um, pretty stark table of federal funding um, that went uh, up and down. Um, and together, so you had books like this. This is Neil Smelzer's theory of collective behavior, totally unconnected to the uh, Chicago tradition. Talcott Parsons student didn't mention media once anywhere in the book, 1962. Um, and of course, this rise of social movements um, became a major topic of sociological interest. And that topic got taken up by self-described collective behavior um, scholars, partly because indeed this fit with the original definition. These are, dis or, or I should say like extra institutional and non-institutional social formations and social movements were there from the beginning. But this was a preoccupation, especially as some of these new left figures retreated into the academy. And <clears throat> over the seventies, the focus on collective behavior and its tight coupling with social movements was pretty evident. Um, here's just a quote from that piece, an increasing number of more activist researchers who view the study of collective behavior as a way to encourage social change. So a lot of interest in what makes social movements tick. But either way, by the time you get the establishment of this 1980 section in sociology in the ESA, media is just not mentioned at all. It's not even a part of the story. It's entirely, it's like, media or communication have been swapped out for social movements, more or less. And <clears throat> that in a way, since uh, I am at time, is sort of the story I wanna talk about. There are some exceptions like William Gamson, for example, sociologists of collective behavior and so on have written about uh, uh, communication in very interesting ways. Some of you may have noticed that there's a, a, a revival inside the ASA of a media section. It's called sit, sit, uh, SITAMS, they might call it that. I mean, it's an acronym for Communication Information Technologies and Media Sociology. But either way, they don't seem to be aware whatsoever of that collective behavior tradition. Um, so that in the end, uh, the sociology of collective behavior seems to have been left without media and communication studies without that Chicago sociology is sort of the punchline, I would say. And um, yeah, that this tradition's dynamic processual picture of social life is untapped really by both media sociologists and communication researchers alike. So uh, thank you. That is it, the same time. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Yeah, works. Okay, for those of you who are just joining us, I'm James Hay moderating this event. Uh, our next speaker 
uh, Pete Simonson. I thought about inviting Pete uh, in part because of this uh, great resource that uh, he and John Durham Peters have edited called Mass Communication and American Social Thought. It's this sort of gargantuan archive of uh, publications that in some respects charts a kind of historical trajectory that Jeff Pooley was uh, addressing interested in what often don't get represented uh, in histories of communication studies. But I think that um, I thought about these two speakers together in part because of Pete's interest in a history of the discipline and also of coming up with slightly alternative archives of uh, of, of the discipline, ones that are continually rethought and refreshed. So uh, without any further ado, because our time is limited here today, uh, it's my uh, honor and pleasure to introduce Pete Simonson, who's from the University of Colorado. Pete. Okay, we're going. Thanks so much, James. Thanks to you. And Teresa Harris um, for setting this up. Um, thanks for y'all being here on a Friday afternoon, the last weekend in April. And our, you're, you're, am I on? Okay. Okay. There we go. All right. Here I am. Uh, and to those of you playing along at home, thank you for being here this afternoon. It's a pleasure to get a chance to talk about um, Jim Carrey. The title that I've given to my talk is um, Carrey's History of Communication Studies with a little asterisk on the communication because we could substitute media, we could substitute culture, we, cultural studies, we could substitute mass communication studies. All those things are kind of mixed in there, though I'll, I'll try to show how they also get pulled out. So um, James had asked me to maybe talk about Carrie in the history of the field or Carrie's histories of the field uh, with some eye toward the present. So being uh, wanting to be, you know, a good guest and student, I've I've tried to do that, and I've tried to um, formulate some comments that might be helpful for graduate students who are newer to this. Might say something to people who knew or studied Carrie, and I suspect that in trying to do both those things, I'm going to do neither one of those things. Um, so that was the hope. Um, I want to uh, kind of do three things in my time. I want to first just recount what Kerry did in terms of writing about the history of uh, communication, communication study, and, and the thinking there, because he did a lot of different things. Um, and this is one niche of what he did that way. Um, a second thing that I want to do then is, is so that's going to be the first piece. Second piece is then asking, so how did these come to be? Um, and there's a lot of ways that we could answer that question, um, but I want to make the pitch on a generational frame and sort of think about the concept of generations um, through Carl Mannheim's sociology of knowledge, but also through Carrie's work. And then the third is, I want to say, given that we're in a really different moment now, we're in a moment of reckoning in the field when we're coming to grips belatedly with the uh, intrinsic structural sexism, racism, um, geopolitics that have constituted our field, which was a different moment than, than Jim was working in, um, though it was starting to come on in a way that he never fully acknowledged. What would it mean to kind of dialectically re-engage Carrie from our current horizons? Um, and so in these moves, I want to you know first say that myself, like a lot of folks in this room and on the call, I suspect, Jim Carrey made space for us, made intellectual space for us. And um, when I was in, I studied with John Peters and Carrie made space for John Peters in really important ways when Peters was at Stanford. And so what I'm talking from and into is a, is a position of identification, right, with this effort um, and appreciation. And that said, Peters said something in a piece he wrote about Carrie that, uh, that Jim Carrey, the only proper tribute for a street fighter and a Democrat, both of which Kerry fiercely is, is a direct confrontation. And so I wanna engage in a little bit of that in a kind of dialectical way, kind of using Kerry to read Kerry and using Kerry to say how we might read Kerry differently in our moment, right? 
Um, in style, I, I don't have slides. I'm just going to go. Carrie was an oral communication kind of guy. I can never live up to the impossible <laughs> eloquence of Jim Carrey, but but I'm going to be speaking that way and making some things that are, you know, maybe intended as provocations and gestures that'll be insufficiently filled out, you know, but here it is Friday afternoon. So, so let's have a conversation together. Other thing I want to say as preliminaries is that I just um, benefited tremendously from Jeff's book, James Carey and, and Communication uh, Research, Reputation at the Margins of the University. And if you don't know, that, it's just a terrific um, intellectual history and sociology of knowledge about Jim Carey. I also benefited, and I'm going to draw on, um, on, on uh, Jeff's work, but also Carolyn wrote a terrific piece um, called The Male Strength and Vulnerability of Jim Carrey that I learned a lot from, and I'm going to riff off. And then John Narone, too, um, the piece that you wrote on looking for the subject of communication history. So I'm in kind of dialogue with some of y'all in the room, and, and Dave uh, and I are always in face-to-face -face dialogue. So that's the setup. Okay, that's what I want to do. So the three things, what is it? Um, how can we think of it generationally? And how can we reread it for the present moment? Um, so first, what am I talking about when I say Carrie's writing on the history of communication, media, cultural studies? From 1967, when he wrote his first piece on uh, first piece in this genre on Harold Innes and Marshall McLuhan, um, really until the first decade of the 20th century, the decade, 21st century that he died, Carey wrote 15 or so pieces that significantly address the history of the field, broadly speaking. Um, he's especially active in that in the 1970s and 80s. This is the big period. And, you know, what does this stuff look like for those of you who may not be familiar with it? Um, a lot of it is exegesis, textual interpretation of individual figures, right? This is the genre that he's working. Um, almost all of them successful North American white men. Um, James, uh, John Dewey, right? Uh, Walter Lippmann, Harold Ennis, Marshall McLuhan, Lewis Mumford. He's given us more or less careful readings of these figures. So this is part of the, the genre. The second thing that he does, besides kind of carefully attending to individual figures, um, is to give us genealogies of traditions. And Jeff has brought this out really nicely in his book. Um, genealogies that often present um, the long view of thinking about communication, kind of typically back to the 17th century, early modernity, um, that pick up steam in the late 19th century, kind of 1890s forward, the, the period that Jeff was talking about with regard to the Chicago school, when communication really becomes problematized in kind of a Foucauldian sense and continue from there. And these genealogies, you know, again, typically are what certainly by the standards of today are genealogies of white Euro-American guys thinking, right? Um, but are often framed in a kind of binary way, right? That you have on the one hand, a dominant tradition. And that tradition is a tradition that is has different names, but it's broadly a tradition of science. And the deep sources of this are like Bacon and Descartes. Uh, and then it moves forward in the 20th century, it gets in contact with communication research and we get everything from behavioralism, functionalism, positivism, the effects tradition, that kind of cluster of things. And that's, and they'll offer us genealogies of the dominant tradition, right? These are his terms. And on the other hand, we have genealogies of the alternative tradition, the one that Kerry is trying to create space for, and that he did in fact create space for. And again, this is gonna have a different names for it. Sometimes we have the tradition of, of science on the one hand, he'll say we have the tradition of history on the other hand, but then history opens up into culture, opens up into interpretivism, um, and with that uh, pragmatism, uh, and a tradition of looking at meanings, right? Looking at cultural conflict, looking more specifically at politics and all this cluster of things, right? And he'll give us those genealogies and that's gonna be you know, where he is gonna find himself. And in that alternative tradition, we have the pragmatists, you know, with Dewey being the big hero, Chicago school, that's kind of an invention of the way he, he said it. I think he said it nice, Jeff. Um, and Clifford Geertz, 
who is a key guy and his interpretive and Jeff has some great stuff on him and how he gets subsumed. But that is, you know, so we get these dueling traditions, right? And deep uh, encounters with individual figures who stand as representative characters in these dramas. And Carrie is above all else, he's a storyteller, right? And so there's always a lot of drama and all of these things. And they're extremely influential, these stories that he told. Um, but you know, here's a little a little clip from Carrie uh, that you give a uh, just, just to give you a sense for those of you who don't know. These two modes of consciousness, one historical, one scientific, have always existed in tension with the scientific clearly dominant dom, dem, dominating. This is 1971. He's writing this uh, so early in his in this genre of work. In the recent history of our association, AEJ at the time, the evidence is clear. It's been the scientific consciousness, mechanical, statistical, causal, universal, that has been dominant. And then he's hoping to carve out some space. So um, intellectual history, history of ideas is what he's up to. Occasionally, one piece in particular will do a little institutional history. He's got a nice 1979 piece on the history of graduate education Jeff and I were talking about last night. And for our money, in a lot of ways, this is like the best, highest quality from a historical perspective piece that he wrote. Because um, as, you know, and John Narone helped teach me this, for Kerry that he got partly through the Siebert, Schramm, Peterson, four theories of the press, history means philosophical history. And there's always going to be this dimension, and he's going to use intellectual history as argument to carve out space for alternative paradigms. So, you know, and that alternative paradigm is going to combine history, interpretation, right, instead of explanation or critique. Those are a little critique in there. Uh, and meaning. That's the kind of three cornered hat of what his cultural approach looks like. So, um, and a word on style. So this, I'm still talking about what is this stuff that I'm talking about, this body of work. Style, you know, I've, I've, I've tipped my hand on a couple of things that way. Um, but um, Jeff says it really nicely um, that Carrie's was an expansive footnoteless style. <laughs> and I think that is exactly right. And it was one of the reasons he's such a pleasure to read, right? <laughs> and you can just, he's the kind of guy you can read at bedtime, right? You yeah. can have him, on the on the bedside table and how many you know communication scholars can we think of that can do that um, but it's in part because there's this expansive footnote uh footnoteless style that ranges from careful readings i think especially of ennis to a certain extent McLuhan, to like gross misreadings, almost caricatured misreadings of Walter Lippmann is the best example. And Jeff's colleague, Sir Curry Jansen, has shown how this thing that you guys may have heard of as well, the Lippmann-Dewey debate, right, quote unquote, is completely made up. Kerry makes this up, right? There's practically no evidence for this, as Sue has shown. And he just gives caricatured reads, really, of Dewey as well, because Dewey's a guy who actually has a deep commitment to science, right? And Carey is reading Dewey in part through Richard Rorty. And Richard Rorty's neo-pragmatism is an anti-science Dewey, right? And so Carey picks up on that, even though you know, he's been reading Dewey for a while. And so, and then on the other hand, just things said about Lippmann. And Lippmann continues to be just like public opinion is a brilliant book. And Carey kind of scared some people off from that. So anyway, you know, and he does all of this with just an enormous confidence, right? The confidence and the charisma of the written word that is also the confidence and charisma of the spoken word for Carrie. You know, so all of these things are sorted together. So, um, you know, as you look back and, and as we look at it, we see that in a lot of ways, it's not a, a history. It's what Raymond Williams would call a selective tradition. And for those of you who don't know, you know, Williams on the idea of a selective tradition, super helpful um, concept. Uh, and, and here's, I'm quoting Williams from uh, Marxism and literature. A selective tradition is an intentionally selective version of a shaping past and a pre-shaped present, which is then powerfully operative in the process of social and cultural definition and identification. And that's exactly what he's doing in the context of academic discourse. He's creating a usable past so that he can carve out, you know, us and them and, and space for an alternative. 
in a way that it, it, there's certainly some verisimilitude to what he's doing is and it's suggested it's always suggestive and it's also often plausible but getting it historically right is almost never his main purpose right um so that selective tradition built on great individual fi figures usually famous white male authors from the from north america um Second, it's built on what he calls a youth, a useful ethnocentrism, that American problems are distinct. And so American traditions of communication need to draw off American thought in some way. And he's against the kind of French imports that are going on in the 80s and 90s of higher theory um, and trying to find an organic uh, political, cultural, intellectual alternative. And then it's this kind of oh, not quite Manichaean but definitely a binary, you know, the dominant tradition and alternative traditions, the scientific tradition and the historical cultural interpretive tradition. Okay, boom. Um, how do we make sense of that? A lot of ways we can make sense of that in terms of what it fulfills in the moment, in terms of purposes, how it resonated, certainly resonated the hell with me in grad school in the 1990s and a lot of us, John Peters, you know, you could get, and you see this in, the, I, I was rereading a lot of the remembrances of him, you know, and just what he meant. And, you know, I'd be interested in those of you who knew him much better than I did, and you all have written about this, but what he meant to so many of us. Um, and so you can talk about the power that way, but I just, playing with the idea of generations. So two things preliminaries that way. One is that Carey himself in the mid 1960s writes about generations and stuff that's not exactly in the center of his canon, you know, but in that famous Innocent McLuhan piece in Antioch Review and in a 1968 essay called Generations in American Society, Carey has taken generations as an important explanatory scheme. Um, he's saying, here's a quote from him, the Industrial Revolution and the rise of the middle class have had the cumulative effect of increasing the importance of generations as basic social units. There was a competition within and between generations to choose the culture by which the generation shall be known. So the social movement slide, you know, the 60s slide, he's writing it in that context, right, generation gap, those kinds of things. Um, and I didn't see him cite Karl Mannheim, but Karl Mannheim is the German sociologist of knowledge who in the 1920s does the kind of classic sociological work on generations as a category, right? And Mannheim says that generations have, quote, certain definite modes of behavior, feeling, and thought that are going to combine culture, geography, where you grow up, you know, but the generations mean something. And of course, we talk like, you know, they do. We recognize that in an everyday sense. But Mannheim is trying to make us think more deeply about how biography, history, uh, society, culture, all entangle. And so I think that when we think about the history of the field, and we think about the way the history of the field has been written, right, the historiography of the field, both those things, the generations have some usefulness in how we think about changes. And this is, again, back to rereading Carrie for the moment, you know, thinking about not my generation, but especially the grad students, you know, your generation and what that's going to mean for um, your understandings of communication, your understandings of, uh, of the genealogies of communication and so forth. So anyway, um, as we think then about um, the history of academic fields, uh, generational dynamics shape what we could call the sociology of knowledge. That's the claim. Um, and it's also worth, you mentioned Elihu Katz, it's also worth mentioning that Carey and his rival, uh, and I don't know if they were exactly friends or not, maybe Carolyn or John know this better than I do. Um, Katz and Carey, were they friends? Were they friends? Yeah, okay. And rivals, right, um, of, of different sorts. They're in the same generation, right? Um, Katz is born in 26, Carey's born in... 34, um, Katz is in the war, Carrie's a little too young to be in World War II, so there's some differences, but they both wrote these really important and really misleading histories of the field, you know, so they have that in common. Um, but as we think about uh, about um, Jim Carey and generational dimensions, I just want to draw attention to three things. Um, gender, and masculinity, and this is where I'm going to riff off Carolyn's piece. Second is kind of national cultural imaginaries 
and how that played out for his generation and how it plays out in his historical writing. And the third is the what we might call ecologies and practices of communication that they came of age in and that I think are shaping in some way. So um, something brief about those three things and I'm looking at time, so I, I'll, I'll, I'll go, uh, I'll try to get it all in. First, gender. So I wanna quote from your piece, Carolyn, because I really, I love what you're doing in there. Um, Jim Carrey had, in your words, a very particular male authority and presence uh, that was complete with the kinds of gestures that boys learn from engaging with men, telling stories back and forth, that you saw him developing these physical gestures through a lifetime of trading stories back and forth with, with the men in his lives. It gave him a particular kind of masculine self-confidence confidence and expressivity, and again, in your words, about which he never showed any particular awareness. His evident pleasure in the high-flown gentility of academic exchange went along with a moral directness that seemed to emanate from the working class background of his growing up. So I think that's just a really interesting point to pull out from. And then I'd add to that, that Kerry was six kids in his family. He's the only son, right? Um, and he grows up in, I mean, it, what in its totality was a highly patriarchal culture and probably even a more patriarchal subculture within that in working class Irish Catholic. And so um, the suggestion, and obviously it would take a lot more to prove this, but that part of what drives the confidence of Carey's prose about the history of the field and his confident sweep in dealing with the great intellectual individual males of history is this embodied male confidence that isn't available in the same way to people who don't fit his subject position, his body, right? And that this is something I think that people talk a lot about his eloquence, his vitality, how that moves. And I think that that is a, that there's an importantly masculine dimension of all of that that you're talking about, Carolyn, and I'm trying to extend it out to how he wrote the histories of the field that way. There's also kind of an agonism in what he's doing, right? And especially in the, the method and theoretical battles of the 1970s. And you can just see some sort of dude stuff at work, right? Not to put too fine a point on it. Um, second thing, um, a generationally structured experience of a national imaginary. Carrie, like cats, came of age in this grand moment of kind of the U.S. national imaginary, World War II and the Cold War. And while Carrie is never a cold warrior, right, and has a complicated view of American exceptionalism, Ken Camille, who was my co-advisor, called um, uh, Carrie's an American exceptionalism without hubris. And I think that's exactly right. And Carrie actually quotes that in an interview he gave with Larry, Larry Grossberg. And so I think he admit, admitted that. But I think that, again, this um, useful ethnocentrism is him in some way imbibing the meta narratives of nation that he came of age in. And in an odd way, the kind of binarism of World War II and, and the Cold War, right, that gets repurposed into a binarism of the dominant tradition and alternatives to it. So, again, you know, these are almost hand waving in the claims that I'm making, but it's Friday afternoon. Um, and then the third thing is just thinking about the characteristic communication ecologies he, 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 that he grew up in. Lifelong Roosevelt Democrat. I hadn't actually seen him write about radio very much in his stuff, which is interesting to me. Um, but he would have been listening to Roosevelt's FDR to his um, fireside chats as a kid, you know. And I think there's a way that both Carrie and Katz have kind of broadcast voices right? They're speaking to the nation. They're speaking across all, you know, segments and that kind of thing. And Kerry also, you know, he's well known that he grew up in kind of what he describes as a pre-modern oral culture. But he also, I found in one of his little remembrances, one of the six teachers who he took multiple classes from at Rhode Island was a speech teacher, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's a way that Kerry kind of brings together like the mass comm journalism and the speech comm dimensions of our field in this odd way and that he embodied the second one, right? Partly from practice and speech and an oral culture, but also from this guy, it may have not been, or this professor, right? Teacher of speech in the fifties at Rhode Island, who I think gave, who he resonated with, who he talked about. Um, so, you know, those three things generationally, I think come through in his work. 
Um, let me quickly, because you always talk too much and too long. Um, one quick thing, professionally and politically, he came or he came into the into the um, field at a great moment in the U in the U.S. University, right? It's just expansion. He has an opportunity. He got tenure. I counted this. He had four published articles and then some shorter things, and he got full on eight published articles and a few. And so the guy had some time to develop his voice, right, in the '60s. And so all of these things, I think, partly made who he was, he benefited from being a male in a homosocial intellectual environment. Um, he had time to think. So um, dialectically engaging, carrying the current context, I've got two minutes and so I'm gonna just kind of quickly go through the four things that I have here uh, and just state them as claims, you know? And here, uh, I'm not trying to do any of these things in a reductive way, you know, uh, nor am I with generations, but kind of a, you know, a dialectical way to see that there were affordances that he had that allowed him to do this work that created so much space for so many of us that are important. And there are limits, particularly from our current perspective. There were limits even in their own terms. First, he was right to bring in thinkers <clears throat> that had a lot to say about media and communication, but weren't in the conversation yet. That's something we need to continue to do. He was wrong to limit those to famous white male authors of the North Atlantic and not provincializing where those cats were coming from, right? Not calling out in any way their positionality. So those are two errors that he has, right? And we need to move forward, continue to expand the canon, and also in a, don, non, in a dialectical way, acknowledge positionalities of the people we bring into, excuse me, our thinking. Um, second, he was right to see that communication was problematized in the decade, in the, especially in the US around 1890s and forward, he was totally, um, he never adequately uh, acknowledged the racial dimensions of that moment, right? This is when Jim Crow is kicking back in in the South, racial violence and white supremacy are taken off in new ways. Uh, and race is, after a first couple of early articles is largely absent from the stuff that he's talking about, you know? And this too is constitutive of the thought of the progressives, either in being ignored or in being an alternative to thinking about true racial um, integration. And again, many more things to say. He was right to see the intellectual importance of the pragmatist tradition, um, but he was wrong in centering too much on Dewey. He should have been bringing in also, or we need to bring in W.E.B. Du Bois, who's crucial, Jane Adams, Charles Sanders Peirce, for different kinds of reasons that I could talk more about. And then fourth, he was right to recognize the transnational dimensions of terms of cultural studies, British cultural studies, American cultural studies, but he didn't see that those things were happening in other contexts as well, especially Latin America. Gramsci is being... Um, is, is translated in Portugal or in Brazil and Argentina before he's translated into English. There are Argentinian Gramscians. Culture and communication are an important um, turn in Latin American communication studies from the 60s on. And so we need to create maps that include all of that stuff as well, right? Um, so with that, you know, Kerry continues to be inspiring. He continues to show us what good writing is. He continues to remind us that the histories of the field count and we can move from his openings to better openings that are more adequate for our own time. Thanks. Thank you so much, Pete. Um, we should have time uh, at the end, I'm hoping we've got a little bit of time, or we can make time at the end, I should add that thought too, for um, some conversation, um, even if it takes us a little bit over uh, our allotted time. Uh, I want to, however, introduce now Professor Carolyn Marvin from the University of Pennsylvania, uh, who was here uh, as a a uh, student at uh, one point, Carolyn and I on the way 
uh, back from the airport last night, we're kind of uh, laughing about uh, the ways in which our past intersects in a particular uh, part of culture of the United States too. But uh, her book, uh, which in some ways develops out of uh, her work here um, when old technologies were new about uh, electricity and communication, I think continues to be uh, an important point of reference, not only the points of reference uh, that Pete was pointing to and that I know Carolyn intends to amplify and to elaborate a little bit more, but uh, I think for particularly a younger generation that is interested in so-called new materialist accounts of uh, of communication, of digital communication, uh, of thinking about electricity, right? And its relation to communication. I think of this as in some respects, um, a, a, a part of a, a something that I've learned as much from Carolyn as I have from Jim in, in different kinds of ways. Uh, and I think about the importance of that book, particularly in relation to current work on infrastructures uh, of media and communication uh, infrastructures. And uh, the fact that I have in my own recent studies on the refrigerator, on uh, personal timepieces and, and all sorts of smart objects, uh, return to rethink McLuhan's uh, thought about the light bulb as a medium without a message. Uh, and, um, and so um, I'm not sure that's entirely the proper way of introducing Carolyn here, but it is in some ways just uh, part of the past and the present as, uh, as I see it uh, in her return to the University of Illinois campus. So join me in welcoming uh, Professor Carolyn Marvin, uh, whose uh, talking head you will see right now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I want to really thank James for that lovely introduction and just for convening uh, all of these people who have an interest in Carrie and are you sharing something? No. What am I supposed to do? Oh uh, yeah, Pete's too tall. <laughs> How's that? Yeah, just right. Okay. Should I just put the X on there? Yeah. 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 My apologies. No, no. I'm not sure that it's my fault. But, uh, let's see. There we go. Okay, well, I want to start by thanking Jeff and Pete both for these really informed uh, accounts, uh, contextualizing Carrie and talking about his history. Uh, and I have to say that I'm going to give a much narrower perspective on him uh, as student. Um, and I'm sort of comforted by Pete's uh, reminder or in informing us that um, both Katz and Carrie wrote really misleading histories of the field. <laughs> because, uh, there may be some of that here. Um, so I didn't know whether to call this presentation Memories of the Culture Club or <laughs> When I Hear the Word Culture. Uh, uh, but I will say all the panelists and many of the rest of you have memories of being in the room when the Jim Carrey oratory banner unfur unfurled. As ephemeral as they were in real time, these were major occasions of association and pride for his students. Then and long after we weren't students anymore. Um, I'd like to make a somewhat embarrassing attempt to describe that experience for us, the effect on us students of his oratory. Because of the towering presence Kerry had in our lives, the effect on us students was uh, best described as a kind of participation mystique, a primitive mode in which the boundaries between oneself and the object of focus fade away. Um, 
the wry self-deprecating stories with which he usually began these orations, I think triggered this magical response. This discursive intimacy, which we rarely saw from him, but longed to know, gave us permission, lowlier persons as we knew ourselves to be, to enter into the circle of his fine words and erudition, almost as equals. It was very heady. We felt ourselves to be thinking with him, our thoughts every bit as lofty as his. I exaggerate, but not by much. By the end of these performances, one felt that life was not just good, but bright, especially the mind, the life of the mind was right. And it was given to us to think and talk about things that mattered. I loved him when he did this, we all did. He transported us away from whatever petty rancor was hovering in the atmosphere to a plane of existence that denied neither tragedy or realistic hope as the conditions of reflective existence. We felt bigger. We came for confession if confession means a cleansing of the soul and grace to repair the broken bonds to our higher selves and each other. We came for confession and were blessed. I know I'm talking about the psychology of students in the presence of a hero, but he was that good. The magic to which I fully subscribed, however, that magic to which I fully subscribed, however, was at odds with my rather more ambivalent perspective on the cultural approach as a student in the late 70s. Uh, I wanna interject here that actually, uh, that wasn't my first graduate program. I came from the University of Sussex and the University of Texas before, um, and I had already figured out a dissertation project essentially for, for what I was gonna do. So in some ways, I was more of a spectator to the student cohort than some of the other um, folks I knew. Uh, by confessing to ambivalence, you will know I, have imagined how the same events that I'm going to describe might have appeared to others in my cohort. Um, and my, uh, you know, I'm thinking of my reflection on those impressions now, as the queen said about the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, reflections may vary. Observing Carrie as a near distance beacon for how to be a teacher and a scholar, uh, I was often skeptical about themes in his work that struck me as grandly more prophetic than theoretically instructive, though I always forgave all when I heard him speak. Take a cultural approach to communication, his best known article, a founding charter for us students. In it, Carey directly reprises Harold Innes's space and time binding framework and gears his public drama of culture with its of and for entailments. Gertz, he, he appropriated more or less straight, um, but he imaginatively repurposed Ennis's flattened abstractions of space and time as ritual and transmission. These concepts which clung to him ever after stood out from the pedestrian accounts around the newly fashionable topic of the social impact of communications technology that were beginning to be heard. As a gentle manifesto, it pointed to richer and deeper possibilities from a wholly different angle of analysis. Uh, he released these into the world as fully formed. Uh, though he never developed or completed them, he often suggestively laminate came, came back to them, laminating each time another eloquent layer of implication and moral consequence. An important role Carey played again and again was shoring up the shaky confidence of aspiring culture scholars, outsiders to their near neck academic neighbors, professional journalism and experimental and survey social science. This dispiriting isolation was reinforced by knowing that the larger academic landscape at that time considered no considered media no lofty subject for serious intellectual inquiry, something a couple of generations of communication scholars um, uh, have put to rout, thankfully. The early efforts of culture scholars to pierce the ethos of professional journalism as the proximate community for investigation 
was received by practitioners on the faculty as a something of a hostile takeover. Carey often spoke to the tensions between professional journalism and academic inquiry, though he never disdained the craft of journalism. As it happened, this painful estrangement from professional journalism had the effect of liberating the cultural approach as we received it, but leaving it stranded with no intellectual authority to call home. For legitimacy, quantitative media scholars had social psychology and sociology and public opinion. At Illinois, at least, the Cary version of the 20th century Chicago School Community Sociology forged few connections to deeper intellectual pasts or presents. Not history or philosophy or anthropology or sociology as it then was. Literary criticism with its connection to popular culture may have come closest. In contrast to his gentle, gentleness with journalism, Carey mounted a fierce and principled resistance to the territory of mainstream media research elevated by a healthy funding apparatus, portable and clear methods, and the power to deliver empirical certainty about things the established discourse of corporations and the government had begun to care about. I have speculated that the grand theory claims Carey found attractive in Innes and Ong in particular might have reflected a kind of ambition to establish a competing media effects regime uh, where the effects were broad and all encompassing and energized not by grants, but by dedication to a project of civic and moral interpretive inquiry, unlike anything American mass communication research could offer in studies of audiences and media effects. He wished to address, as he put it, a more substantial domain of existence after psychology and sociology are exhausted. <clears throat> if the threats posed by modern forms of communication to the fragile order of democracy were invisible to science, uh, hmm. <laughs> let me see what I'm doing here. Um, these can be, these could be considered with the right kind, these could be considered uh, with a more sensitive inquiry into the media and the world uh, they inhabited uh, to build a socially necessary public conversation while providing space for the cultural approach to grow in the discipline and not least in confidence. This was how I heard it. Um, however, at Illinois, that shoring up process produced less an action strategy or useful intellectual conversation than a kind of fortress mentality that circulated and flowed through the student cohort, um, isolated from the traditions uh, adjacent to us and regarding Carrie as the final and only spokesperson of the cultural approach, we became a kind of intellectual cult, an island unaware and uninterested in what was going on elsewhere in the field and in our own school. All this was in contrast to the modesty of the labels Carey himself used to describe what he wanted cultural scholars to be up to. A cultural approach, a ritual view, nothing so declarative as critical theory or deconstruction or positivism or post-structuralism wearing their claims to authority on their face. It was. Here are some suggestions. The conversation is never over. This expression of intellectual humility was intended to stand, I think, against models and methods that, as Carrie saw it, closed down conversation for the doubtful gods of replicability and prediction. So what did a cultural approach really encompass? It wasn't always clear from the point of view of students. For my cohort, there was little effort to fill in the intellectual spaces behind Ennis and Ong in the Chicago school in the Clary classroom. There were fleeting references to Durkheim, Weber, Huizinga, Vico, Dil Diltai, Yates, Kassir, Schutz, Charles Taylor, Kenneth Burke, Foucault, C. Wright Mills, and others, 
but these never worked their way into the curriculum. We read a bit of the Chicago School, less of the Frankfurt School, some Dewey, no Lippmann, Ortega. We were assigned parts of Uses of Literacy by Richard Hoggart and Culture and Society by Raymond Williams and Innes and Ong. We absorbed them largely without comment or discussion with each other. There was certainly no comparison of models for cultural analysis. I doubt Kerry saw this as a pedagogical omission. I think he felt it was up to us to choose what was worth our time. This had mixed results. What we heard were appealing and somewhat sentimental abstractions about culture as a symbolic process whereby reality is produced, maintained, repaired, and transformed. This was lofty but unspecific ground. What does culture express? The social order, another black box to decode. Does one take soundings? If culture is the sum of the general process of living, how would we go about unraveling it um, for investigation? How should we meaningfully organize the conventions, practices, and institutions we observed? What were we trying to find out? What is the structure of the structure of feelings? How do rituals work on their congregants? Can they fail? If so, how? I can't recall that we were ever sent out to do interpretive exercises for critique by professors and peers. Carrie had a Rorian indifference to method which he summarized as valued habits, full disclosure, willingness to provide reasons, openness to experience, an arena for systematic criticism. There was no discussion of evidence or even close noticing. The interpretive currency we trafficked in was insight, somehow arrived at. It was every sensitive investigator for herself. Here is an example from my time as a student. During the course of a lecture, students heads bowed, taking notes, Kerry referenced World War II. He said the reason the French surrendered to the Nazis was they weren't prepared to sacrifice Paris. They cared more about their culture than the English who allowed London to be bombed because, because their culture was less important to them. My head snapped up. Kerry saw this and noted my astonishment with a wry and I think surprised twinkle. He didn't take it back or qualify it. It went unchallenged as a privileged data point for culture interpreted. His not unfriendly acknowledgement of my telegraphed gasp meant, I believe, he registered the wild overreach of that claim. It certainly aligned with his well-known animus toward the British for centuries of Irish exploitation and mistreatment. <laughs> I think he believed such daily details to borrow from De Dewey, in this case, something more than a daily detail, indexed a genuine totality from which a deep structure of consciousness um, could be holographically amplified to explain patterns of practice, rendering other explanations uninteresting and unnecessary. This one, this claim belonged to the family of uh, broad gauge unfalsifiable notions that Innes trafficked in um, about whole centuries and civilization. Structures of feeling might rise and fall mysteriously, but were ever present to the discerning. The oral tradition, a central signifier for the cultural approach remained gauzy. The specificity of its features, except as a negative of writing, were unarticulated. Its unfolding uh, accommodation with literacy and other media, indeed to our world, uh, unaddressed. <clears throat> 
In one of the few evidentiary analyses we read, Walter Ong posited the existence of primary orality uh, for which he claimed a uniform psychological structure in unschooled humans that somehow drained away into secondary orality, whatever this was, from even the slightest contact with literacy. Evidence for the mode effects of primary orality were adduced from anecdotes about how forest dwellers in Africa orally processed the sen their sensory environments. This was awkwardly scaled up to explain the literate difficulties of inner city African-American kids many generations from the African forest. This may suggest a little why the oral print binary and the ritual transmission binary, I would call them strong claims, failed to take root in the field. They implied but could not deliver a fleshed out empirical or structural analysis equal to the weight of the attributed effects. Prompts for intriguing conversation to be sure, but not a power schema for Verstehen. Perhaps the cultural approach was an altogether different epistemological animal. There are arts and there are sciences. Perhaps what Kerry was groping toward was never science and always art. If so, the faculties of imaginative empathy and enhanced sensitivity were wholly appropriate. And the remark about the French and the English, a splash of paint, a brush stroke on a canvas that could be painted over with more arresting images. Art, especially philosophical art, cultivates its own forms of knowing through alternative expressivities. It doesn't subscribe to rules, it invents them as it goes. If it makes them, it is not contained by them. Traditions of art are to be entertained, explored, manipulated, rejected, or all these at once. The revelatory value of art does not hang on theoretical consistency. It moves us to share our aesthetic responses to the intricate, complex, and astonishing varieties of expressive imagination. This captured much of the intention of the cultural approach. The most formidable rival to the cultural approach turned out to be neither professional journalism nor quantitative research. It was, of course, British cultural studies, the Birmingham School with its Gramscian roots and highly articulated theoretical language, uh, finding its place in this, the post Frankfurt School sun. And that moved aside the aspirations of the cultural approach in the field. British cultural studies offered a platform for engaging with European critical research traditions that were largely mystified and ignored in American communication studies. It did not ignore political economy. It reached beyond the mass media to other cultural forms and situations. Its methodological bona fides were not that different from the cultural approach, but it invented theory like gangbusters. I don't think Kerry was hostile to the provocative and uh, extensively research explorations of subcultural practices and institutions from the Birmingham School. The sticking point for Carey, as most here will know, was the pivot to domination. <laughs> Carey could not endorse a conceptual imperialism that he felt unselfconsciously described, as Rorty puts it, about liberal irony, everything important in terms of a final vocabulary validated in the end like any other simply by adoption and practice. For Carey, there were more complicated layers of contingency from which life worlds and social effectivities were fashioned. He insisted on respect for the self-crafted lives articulate for self-crafted lives articulated on their own terms of control and vulnerability. Um, and took exception to structural notions of constraint and power that he felt elided the considerable but fragile triumphs uh, of collective agency. There is one strand of 
Carrie's intellectual commitment that I think is not much talked about, although Pete actually did talk about it, and that is his liberalism, which I think also uh, explains a lot of his resistance to uh, British cultural studies. Um, I was going to actually uh, talk about Carrie in terms of his generational relationship to 20th century liberalism. Uh, both in terms of his, although he wasn't fighting, he was definitely aware of World War II as a kid and that generational effort to defeat fascism, but also uh, the whole 20th century liberal tradition, uh, liberals of his stripe believed that the great task of democracy uh, was to secure conditions for the exercise of personal dignity in a society of similarly dignified others. Um, and actually, then I was just basically to defend liberalism, which never gets defended. Uh, I do remember Carrie, uh, who was a liberal through and through, um, being denounced loudly at a conference uh, as a liberal with a kind of um, fun mirror house version of liberalism for preferring reform to revolution and um, uh, being. Um, enabling evil by tolerating it, hesitating to call out injustice and cruelty. Of course, liberals and, guilt and Kerry were guilty of none of it. Uh, he, of course, was a street fighter and he gave back as good as he died. It was, a, it was a minor event, but I think it also identified him as having a certain positionality uh, at a time when the new left had discredited liberalism uh, in order to forge their own generational identity and forgotten a lot of the achievements of uh, liberalism in the 20th century. Um, these accusations miss the liberal rejection, Carrie's liberal rejection of preening infallibility and self-righteousness, his respect for the stories of others and belief in the redemptive possibilities for transferring, for transforming even the most blinkered convictions, even our own, in a free and open encounter with the despised other of whatever side. A story he told stays with me because it expresses the best of liberal tolerance and the generosity of Carrie's own character. He recounted an interview with Henry Hampton, director of the important documentary series, Eyes on the Prize. As Carrie told it, members of the editing and production teams did not want the SEGs, uh, to appear on film in interviews in which they would reflect on their place as they understood it in that history. After a long discussion, Hampton said he would let them speak. He said, it's their story too. That was everything that counted for me about Carrie's ethical belief that curiosity and compassion offer the greatest promise for repairing a fractured world. A plea for the university tradition is Carey's uh, liberal assessment of the perils to academic integrity from the media and professions. He was prescient. Nearly five decades later, uh, I can hardly imagine how he would view our nearly complete surrender to the logic of professionalism. Um, starting with our unresisting capitulation to branding on display in our email signatures, trailing titles and associations and links to our books, assiduously created Wikipedia and LinkedIn pages, carefully tended Twitter following, slick websites, ever expanding online CVs, um, the racking up of media slots for dispensing sound bites. Professional headhunters oversee the selection of presidents and deans, Two central challenges to our present and future democracy, inequality and racism uh, ought to engage every faculty uh, in a process of critical and intelligent public discourse. Shamefully, many faculties seem loath to have this discussion, not trusting ourselves uh, to explore different perspectives about the nature of the problem and what is to be done. That discussion has been officially squelched and punted to DEI administrators, the cheerful acronym 
trivializing the gravity of the topic. These well-meaning human resource professionals with binders of bullet points ticking off best practices to demonstrate how they're on top of these issues. They occupy the public facing space uh, that, that shows the university cares. The most troubling development may be the administrative uh, prioritizing of public relations over urgent and emerging questions about academic freedom, subverting faculty deliberation uh, and res proper fa faculty deliberation and resolution in the name of avoiding public controversy. All this is the destruction of conversation in any sense Carrie had in mind when he spoke of the singular mission of the university to keep alive styles of, of thoughts and forms of discourse the powerful would extirpate. This is a legacy to embrace. Um, and there, here I had <laughs> a section on public, on, uh, pub, on social media and how social media actually kind of recovered some of its authority uh, despite all the criticisms that we make properly of social media in, in its willingness to collect very different speakers uh, and to uh, and uh, and because of its um, because of its proximity to uh, the to conversation itself, short form spontaneously, spontaneous, highly context dependent talk. Uh, arguably and not insignificantly has contributed to democratic discourse, actively engaging in de deliberative talk or at the least pointing to it for those who took the trouble. Um, but this finally brings us back to Kerry for whom resistance to the market and professional rationality meant maintaining through the oral tradition, the ideals of public life, fostering the debate, evidence, and argument on which rationality worth the time is founded. Perry's oral tradition was maybe never meant as the tool of analysis I found wanting as a student. I don't think I understood it then as something to strive for as an ideal. The oral tradition is better thought of as embodied engagement uh, with different, um, with different human experiences and efforts of social care. The oral tradition was no more a cutting tool than the liberal tradition of participation was about Robert's rules of order. Embodiedness and participation are the foundations um, for learning how to follow an argument, grasp the point of view of another, expand the boundaries of understanding and debate alternative purposes that might be pursued. Um, in Carrie's rendering. <clears throat> Carrie's memorable idea was that um, genuine deliberation is always slow compared to media, which is fast. Slow is what we do with students day by day. Slow is pausing for discussion for mutually curious discussion with our colleagues. Slow is necessary to build an effective political coalition. Um, slow is choosing an appropriate civic scale for engaging for communities with which we can effectively engage and in which the elderly, the bereaved, the homeless, immigrants and refugees, the incarcerated, the traumatized, the poor among us, the disaffected are visible as citizens and neighbors to each other. In this imaging, the oral tradition, is the accumulated wisdom of lumpy and particular bodies. It is no magic bullet. I think Carrie would say that any moral authority the university deserves rests on a commitment that everything we do as scholars should be worthy of the public we hope to have as supportive partners in democratic life. We need to find slow ways to explain 
what we do and why, to hear what that means to the neighbors we live among, and to adjust our own ways of considering our role in response. That would be a good legacy to honor Jim Carrey. Thank you. Okay, we've got uh, another one more speaker. Let me uh, get it to a different. Well, once again, for those joining late, I'm James Hay, the moderator uh, of this part of the event, James Carey and media, the past and the present, media studies, the past and the present. Uh, our last presenter, David Park, um, is somebody that I thought about uh, not only because of his um, collaborative relations with some of the other panelists today, uh, and particularly in something called the Communication History uh, Listserv and its relation to uh, a division in the International Communication Association. Um, and so I, because we're short on time, uh, not his time, uh, Dave, you have uh, the time that you need. Uh, I'm gonna let, uh, I'm gonna move uh, to uh, his presentation uh, I will try to make some time at the end of this for any questions or comments that those of you who are Zooming in have. So uh, if you want to begin to formulate them, uh, you can ask them rather than submitting them uh, by chat uh, later on. So Dave, uh, pleasure to uh, have you as part of the conversation today. Thank you. There we go. Uh, okay, it's working. First look at thank everybody here uh, today uh, in what's called Meet Space. Um, hi, uh, and for those of you in uh, what we pretend is not non-Meet Space, Carolyn would always remind me, it's all Meet Space, Dave. Um, uh, hi to you as well, Steve, your name is... Uh, the main thing behind me right now. Uh, <laughs> you haunt me in my dreams. Um, uh, the title of my talk today is provisionally, yeah, thanks for the emoji, um, is uh, tantalizingly called screen of screen door communication, um, uh, a title that opens up a narrative gap, I hope, of some kind. Um, uh, I didn't know Jim Carrey very well. Uh, many of the people here knew him far better than I did. I had a couple great conversations with him. Uh, one of the best conversations I had with him was about Bob Newhart. Uh, Bob Newhart, uh, one of the most important entertainers of the 20th century. I believe one of the first people, uh, actually, I think the first recording artist, Steve, correct me if I'm wrong, to have uh, both the number one and number two uh, selling albums in the United States. Um, I think the Beatles... Uh, caught up with him at some point. Um, but um, a lot of instructive comparisons between Kerry and Newhart, both Irish American, both uh, born uh, during the Great Depression, lived with that. Uh, Kerry's born in 34, uh, Newhart's born in 29. Um, both Irish American, both Roman Catholic, both from big cities. Um, and Carrie loved him. Uh, so did I. Uh, shared affection. And Carrie in particular loved this one sketch that uh, helpfully frames uh, uh, a presentation that I'm about to provide. Um, it's called the Mrs. Grace L. Ferguson uh, Airline and Storm Door Company. Uh, perhaps some of you are familiar with this. It's wonderful. Uh, it's classic Newhart, um, and Jim told it really well, uh, paraphrasing it exactly as you would expect from Jim in a way that made it funny, but was very inaccurate. Um, um, uh, it's a bit about, uh, he gets a, a few days off from the military and decides to fly to Florida and, I'm sorry, fly to Hawaii. And um, it's the early 60s, aviation's taking off. A major premise of the bid is, boy, there are a lot of new airlines these days, aren't there? Uh, which doesn't resonate in 2023 uh, all that well uh, as consolidation takes its toll there. Um, 
uh, pretty funny sketch. Uh, and uh, as soon as uh, Newhart says it's the Grace, Mrs. Grace L. Ferguson Airline and Storm Door Company, uh, the crowd erupts, the crowd in Houston where it was recorded, yeah, erupts in laughter. Um, and a lot of the bit is the classic um, Bob Newhart delivery, uh, which, by the way, uh, you can look up uh, Marshall McLuhan, Love Newhart, wrote to him uh, because he thought he was the epitome of uh, a cold medium, especially with the one sided telephone gag. Um, that worked pretty well for a, uh, an intercom on an airplane, um, where um, the bit is, these guys aren't very good at being an airline. One suspects it has something to do with the fact that they're also running a storm door company. Um, and uh, it ends with the pilot saying on his way to Hawaii, just coming on the intercom and saying, this is what Jim rendered it as. Does anybody know what Hawaii looks like? Uh, <laughs> and... Um, uh, I will stop riffing on Newhart. Uh, it's uh, it's an insult to him and to, to Jim Carrey. Um, but uh, the Grace L. Ferguson Airline and Storm Door Company is a lot like the academic study of communication uh, with a problematic understanding of navigation um, and promises to engage both in uh, flying very high and also the manufacturer of storm doors, um, which probably plagues it quite a bit. Um, we found a way to get a loft um, we don't know how to navigate very well. Uh, and um, here we all are. Um, uh, my colleagues have already said uh, uh, they've denigrated Jim's understanding of the communication research history, not denigrated, but uh, uh, critiqued it beautifully. Uh, I'm here to agree with them, um, but also here to point out, Jim really did successfully point out some important uh, lacunae in uh, the historiography of mass communication research. Um, he was the one who said, strictly speaking, there is no history of mass communication research in uh, Chicago School of Mass Communication Research. Uh, he made occasional efforts to fill in some of the gaps. What I'm going to be discussing today um, is one of these major gaps in uh, the history of mass, uh, history and communication research and history of communication scholarship, uh, the creation and early life of the National Society for the Study of Communication, which would later change its name in 19. Uh, 69 to the International Communication Association. Um, uh, so that's what I'm talking about. And then I'm going to bring that back and fit it into the kinds of things that Kerry was talking about, or at least I'll attempt to do so. Um, uh, Kerry's uh, work in the history of mass communication research, uh, they were interventions, uh, just like Pete and Jeff and to some degree Carolyn uh, have pointed out already. Um, they were explicitly interventions. They were attempts to change what we were doing um, uh, in the language of the Grace L. Ferguson Airline and Storm Door Company. He was flying around with everybody else trying to get people to uh, come up with some different places to go. Um, I'm here to remind uh, myself and everyone else, uh, the study of communication, especially in the United States, uh, um, to provincialize it quite a bit, was very much uh, unlike these kinds of um, battle royales between dinosaurs that Kerry uh, didn't invent always, um, but uh, that he cast. Um, and uh, there have been some very good histories of the International Communication Association. This may be one of them. Um, but uh, I want to turn the way back machine to the idea of the communication course in the United States. So frequently, when people talk about the history of communication study in the US, they go back to the 1940s, they go back to Columbia, they go back to uh, sometimes Chicago. Um, uh, an important, one of the most important chapters in communication study in the U.S. comes with the communication course, uh, which uh, could be found at colleges and universities across the United States for quite some time, uh, starting in the 1930s. Kara, Kara Finnegan and Marissa Lowe Wallace outlined the widely received narrative of how the communication course came to exist and thrive. Um, these courses, they say, which emerged in the World War II era, combined instruction in written composition and public speaking, and as a result, provided opportunities for teachers in speech and English to collaborate. Their rise primarily was fueled by an urgent wartime need for communication instruction that was pragmatic and skills-based. After the war, the founding of the College Conference on Composition and Communication, the four C's, in 1949, appeared to solidify the place of the new communication courses in the transformed post-war GI Bill University. 
Finnegan and Wallace make a crucial kind of correction to this received narrative. Uh, the, that the impetus for the communication course originated not during World War II, but in the 1930s, when the Great Depression was the exigency that spurred numerous universities and colleges to develop a communication course. Um, this was happening at hundreds, um, hundreds is fair, I wanted to uh, say thousands, but uh, hundreds of colleges and universities uh, in the United States. Not only do Finnegan and Wallace correct the timing for the rise of the communication course, they also point to the importance of noticing how the basic communication course's widespread adoption had as much, if not more, to do with local institutional structures and pressures than with professional associations and journals, let alone um, famous sociologists, uh, other people from uh, outside communication who uh, are identified as capital F founders. Writing in 1955, Thomas F. Dunn connected these early communication courses to uh, the general educational movement of the 1930s, uh, when communication courses and nascent communication courses were developed in response to the challenges of higher education. <clears throat> the founding of NSSC, the National Society for the Study of Communication, was tied directly to concerns that stemmed from the local institutional structures that Finnegan and Wallace describe and to the general educational movement that Dunn considers. Uh, put mildly differently, this was not uh, an intervention from above on the level of theory or uh, um, even scholarship. This was uh, a bubbling up from all over the place of uh, determining that undergraduates should be taking a course in communication as part of their general instruction, uh, largely because it was seen as useful. Um, Lots of this is uh, spun around um, a University of Denver uh, instructor named Elwood Murray, um, uh, who uh, lobbied at the Speech Association of America, now the National Communication Association, uh, to, um, well, Murray was uh, pretty direct. This is Elwood Murray, founder, probably the most important founder of the National Society for the Study of Communication. Uh, going to the Speech Association of America and saying um, that uh, it was time for the Speech Association of America to modernize, to take heed of the fact that there were all these communication instructors uh, who were not so tied to what the Speech Association of America was doing. Um, traditionalists in the Speech Association of America, like Murray, Elwood Murray, generally eschewed psychology, personality approaches, and general semantics, speech pathology, and radio television, that's as close as he would ever get to describing mass communication, were being chopped off from the old speech tree and were growing into their own national organizations, which was a very retrogressive thing to happen because all of these were speech and mass media. Um, Kerry would pick up on this. And if you want to look at the relationships as they actually occur, they are special processings and extensions of interpersonal communication. Interpersonal communication is primarily speech. Uh, there are a lot of slippages in there. Uh, you can count them next time I read it. Uh, uh, 1949, there's a Speech Association of America convention in Chicago and Elwood Murray and um, some of the other founders of the NSSC put together uh, a plan for this new affiliate organization for the Speech Association of America. They more or less had a, an ultimatum with the president of the Speech Association of America, which was, look, we can either be an affiliate group of the Speech Association of America, or we can go off and make our own thing. Do you really want that uh, SAA? Um, and President James McBurney um, uh, at Northwestern, wound up eventually uh, after some hand wringing saying, yeah, uh, you can be an affiliate group of the Speech Association of America. Um, uh, they found the group, uh, they put it together. Uh, it becomes a, um, an affiliate group of the uh, Speech Association of America not long after. So this is late 1949, uh, the National Society for the Study of Communication comes into existence on January 1st, 1950, um, founded by, uh, worth pointing out, these were not people uh, we encounter very frequently in Jim's histories of uh, communication scholarship or really many other people's. Uh, Paul Bagwell uh, from Michigan State College, H.P. Constance uh, from the University of Florida, he was in their theater department, he was a puppeteer. Uh, Paul McKelvey from Stanford University, um, English professor, Franklin Noer from Ohio State University, speech professor, 
Ralph Nichols uh, from University of Minnesota, whose specialty was listening. Uh, Wesley Wixell from Louisiana, Louisiana State University, who had just completed the um, uh, survey of communication courses around the country, and Elwood Murray himself. Um, uh, a few things to notice about this group, um, uh, largely from uh, what could be called provincial uh, schools. This was not the Ivies. It was barely the Big Ten. It was Stanford uh, and University of Minnesota. Ohio State played a big role. Um, I, I still think their role in uh, the history of the field is underrated, uh, under understood, uh, understudied. Um, and it quickly gets agreed. They're going to do annual meetings um, every spring. Um, they will uh, not be separate from the Speech Association of America. They would separate off in 1967. Um, and there are a few lessons we can take from this, I think. Um, uh, first of all, uh, NSSC, what would become ICA, was not founded as one would be tempted to suspect given NCA's and ICA's present situations. It was not a group of social scientists who said, we want a social science thing, so give it to us. Their ideas were largely scientific, I'll come back to this in a little bit, but they weren't tied to any specific social science uh, field whatsoever. There's the one mention of psychology that uh, Murray offers, very few other mentions of psychology, no mentions of anthropology, not that surprising, zero mentions of sociology, um, no mentions of economics. Uh, it was understood that communication was an applied field of study. Um, all of this stemming from uh, the deep investment that many institutions had in the communication course. Um, incidentally, the first communication course offered uh, not at Columbia University, not at University of Illinois, uh, offered at Stevens College, a women's vocational school in Missouri, uh, who still have a communication program that has split into a few vocational specialties, many of which will be familiar to uh, public relations, advertising, et cetera. Um, so this all comes out of a dispute concerning the communication course. Uh, in a way, communication study mushrooms in the 1930s. No one can contain it. Um, uh, they can't hope to contain it. Uh, and the NSSC grows out of that. The argument to be made about what happens with ICA after this is that it grows out of, uh, it builds onto a structure that is largely vocational in, uh, in its nature, largely about undergraduate uh, pedagogy. Um, it's very instructive and not necessarily recommended for all of you to read the first few years of the Journal of Communication, 1951, vol volume one comes out. It's not that it's bad. Uh, I don't, nothing's, what's bad? Uh, but um, uh, uh, it's that it's, uh, the articles are uh, largely about um, uh, their think pieces. Uh, there are a lot of book reviews, more book reviews than the Journal of Communication has published in the last 35 years, I might point out. Um, uh, there are a lot of uh, synthetic pieces, attempts to shore things up, and lots and lots of surveys of what is this communication course, where is it going, what do we see happening, um, and lots of tips, uh, articles that involve uh, tips for teaching. Um, I just made it sound more trivial than I intended to, but uh, it doesn't take long to see the pedagogical emphasis there. Um, there were many different contexts for the communication course that was particularly common in English and speech curricula. The widespread adoption of the communication course itself, a kind of intellectual orphan, uh, finding its impetus in the desires of upper level administrators and even in the, um, uh, even in presidents, uh, threatened established means of teaching speech associated as it was with rhetoric, literature, and even philology. Um, bye, Sean. Um, SAA was quickly divided into a camp of traditionalists fighting against the camp of insurgents, which sounds Carrie-esque, uh, but uh, gets a little more complicated. One side believing that the communication course ought to be tethered to traditional pedagogy, another side taking the communication course as an opening to something more interdisciplinary and applied and definitely scientific, which is different from saying um, that it was tied to any social science uh, in particular. Um, Psychology received some mention, and that's it. Uh, NS the NSSC came out uh, instead out of a dispute that was tied up with speech communication, 
and how and whether to make the transition from speech, in quotes, to communication. Um, uh, significantly, the Speech Association of America didn't use communication in its name. NSSC did use communication in its name. Um, that's the communication difference, my argument, that it's creating a kind of uh, a tradition in studying communication that is uh, about being useful and structurally is about doing things administrators want to see the university to do. They rarely came about as the result of uh, professors' own um, preferences. Um, Kerry himself, uh, in Overcoming Resistance to Cultural Studies, says that um, he didn't want to call it cultural studies. He, uh, he didn't want to call it cultural science, but cultural studies is a very familiar uh, passage from him because he abhorred the, the honorific sense that has accumulated around the word science. Uh, and in graduate education in mass communication, he says, on only one thing was there general consensus uh, in the founding of the, uh, the field of communication, which he's addressing there, it was necessary to be scientific as that term was then understood. We're very familiar with this, the idea that communication had scientific ambitions. Um, uh, I'm not, with the rise of the NSSC in the late 40s into the 50s, it was still science. Uh, um, Kerry notes that the focus on effects of mass communication arose not from the interests of particular disciplines or even from business interests, but from what he called the positivism and behaviorism that he found buried deep within the general culture. This is a great case of this. These were not trained sociologists saying, we want communication to be more sociological and we're gonna study media effects. No one's mentioning media effects in any of this. Uh, this was just a uh, something much closer to just a kind of barometer of what people thought academic study should do in classes. They wanted it to be science. What kind of science? Uh. Um, uh, it was a diffuse positivism, a science-shaped aspiration. Uh, with Albert L. Kreiling, Kerry once described the shift in the field from powerful to limited effects in the 40s and 50s. Um, uh, he compared that to a shift from a prophetic to priestly class for the professors. Uh, once outsiders hurling barbs at the establishment, he said, now communication scholars were insiders protecting their more secure place. How does that write onto this? Uh, I'm here to remind uh, all of us, uh, the case of the National uh, Society for the Study of Communication reminds us that much of the of communication study in the US is missed uh, out on here in what Kerry describes. These people were outsiders and they were not throwing barbs. They were trying to figure out how to become insiders with their applied teaching and their soon to come links to industry. Um, fascinating. Uh, ICA was for a time headquartered in Flint, Michigan for proximity to the auto industry, uh, offered a uh, uh, kind of audit for uh, private corporations uh, to make them more efficient. Um, and uh, general in the Air Force was uh, one of the major leaders in, uh, in the National Society for the Study of Communication in the 50s, in the 60s. Um, it might not have taken, but one thing about Kerry's narrative of insiders and outsiders, um, Carolyn touched on this beautifully, of uh, uh, you know, the kind of re rebels trying to um, uh, do battle with um, a uh, uh, not so great group of leaders is that here's this other group that are definitely outsiders trying desperately to get in uh, that gets missed in many of our uh, histories of communication study. Kerry once described speech and journalism programs, and this is very good, as practical enterprises, enterprises seeking academic uh, legitimation. He's talking about speech and journalism programs. He is also, perhaps without knowing it, talking about these communication courses and this kind of diffuse communicationness going on all over the place. Uh, the National Society for the Study of Communication in its first decade shows that even without the formal ties to speech or journalism, much of the communication project in academia was also a practical enterprise seeking academic legitimation. Um, we are still uh, a field that makes screen doors. Thank you very much. We're over time technically, uh, James Hay here again, but uh, if uh, we've 
we could have five or 10 minutes for anybody who wants to um, stay around. The participants of this event are still here. Uh, a few others in the room that may need to, uh, to leave. Uh, no apologies necessary if you do need to leave, but if you have uh, a question, uh, I'll try to uh, organize the uh, exchange with uh, the group here. So um, do we have any questions? Uh, Angela? Hi. I, I feel so, James, thank you for organizing this. This has been so delightful over the last couple of days. And I wish I could be there with you in the room. I'm in town, but I couldn't make it to campus this afternoon. Um, Jeff, my first question, thank you so much for your presentation. I, um, as someone who is a trained communications scholar who studies like um, kind of group formation around documentary, I've been, and has a documentary practice, I've been living the disconnection of the way media has been lopped off from communication in my career. Um, and so you brought a lot of the intellectual threads that I'd been missing together for me. Um, and I'm really looking forward to diving into your book, but I have an actual minutia question for you. Um, you talk, I love your analysis of Park, and you say that he spent 10 years with Booker T. Washington at the Tuskegee Institute. And I'm curious what dates on which that happened because Famously, Booker T. Washington does something quite innovative in 1909 through 1911, and that's he makes documentary films to try to influence white philanthropists. And I'm just curious if there was any crossover of Park and Booker T. Washington at that moment. Come on up if you want. Sure. Um, get closer to the microphone in any case. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Angela. And just to, you know, answer that specific question, um, I don't know the dates precisely, but it's basically around 1904 to about 1913. So there should be that overlap. Um, that overlap. Because kind of I can't be figure out why Booker T. Washington is doing films instead of doing other forms of media that are much more accessible at that moment. And the fact that, your, yeah. Yeah, the fact that Park is there is like, whoa, um, kind of blowing my mind a little bit right now. So we need to talk more. And I'm really excited about your work and I'm gonna go read your things, all of them. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. And I'm gonna actually take your name down and I'm gonna do a search for whether I could find anything in the literature on Park okay. um, and send it to you. But yeah, let's keep that conversation going. Thank that you. would be great. Yeah. Um, the other question real quick, if I can ask um, Carolyn, is that I've been reading recently a little bit about um, Carrie's like initial encounter with the Birmingham school. And there is this like, I think in one of the compilations put together by former students, there's this talk of like how, you know, the Birmingham school and Ho and, and Carrie um, start to make these connections as Hogarth and Carrie talk. And you're kind of talking a little bit about an end stage kind of like tension between the Birmingham School and Carrie. And so I'm wondering if you could fill any of the gaps in between them initially exchanging syllabus and um, ideas and readings to actually becoming quite tentious between Carrie and Birmingham. Yeah. Um... I can't give you a lot of specific information, but if you haven't seen um, Stuart Hall's, uh, what is it, Two Cultural Paradigms, that's a very good place to look. Okay. Uh, because he talks about the cultural approach. He's really talking about Raymond Williams. But okay. uh, Carrie, I mean, he's talking a lot about Raymond Williams as sort of the culturalist side as opposed to the structuralist side where he talks about Levi Strauss and others. Uh -huh. um, and also the Birmingham School, which had certainly a lot of structural uh, devices that it used. Uh, but but as I was reading it myself, you know, rereading it and kind of looking at it, it's pretty clear to me that uh, he's you know he's thinking about Carrie as well as as well as about Hoggart and and um, uh, Raymond Williams and. You know, Carrie's cultural approach uh, really, for example, never included the long revolution um, 
and um, he and also he didn't talk about E.P. Thompson at all, who was uh, who Stuart Hall sort of uh, counterposes to to Williams. So so I think I think that was a very I think there were a lot of exchanges going on in that particular conversation. Um, and and Carrie, you know, so I think Carrie was very aware of those kind of things. And I think Carrie was well, I would obviously better I think Stuart Hall was very aware of what Carrie was up to and thinking about it in his formulation of the tension between culturalism and structuralism and um you know the Birmingham tradition as it was developing. So and, and I, was, I, would, I would just add that. too, Angela, yeah. to uh, what um, Carolyn just said is that unfortunately we lost Larry Grossberg. Uh, he was here for the meeting on uh, Thursday, but uh, was only able to attend the first hour of the meeting. He has a note uh, saying he's sorry he missed Carolyn's talk in particular. But, um, you know, Larry is a particularly important sort of bridge in some ways between British cultural studies and Jim Carrey. Larry was one of the only um, students from the United States who studied at the Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies. And when he came back, or when he was looking to return to the United States, he asked Stuart, so Larry's story has gone for a long time, uh, you know, where he should go and study. And Larry said, go and seek out. James Carey. Uh, and so uh, when Larry began to invite uh, his former protégés, uh, colleagues from graduate college at Birmingham and Stewart to visit the University of Illinois over the 1980s, um, then that was something that cemented that bridge. But you're right that uh, Jim had visited England and had heard um, uh, I mean, I, I, I want to open it up to other uh, mm -hmm. questions. We're running short on time. I don't want to belabor that, but I just uh, mentioned that as a reference to Larry's uh, presence and now absence uh, in the group. Anybody else? Uh, yeah, we have um, a, a person here in the room, uh, Anita, Anita, Anita Chan. Anita, can you come up or participate by, yeah, thank you. I can't see you. Hey everyone. Oh, for the others, yeah. Everyone, <laughs> I'm Anita Chan. I'm a faculty member here in the ICR, so I'm familiar to some of the folks in, in the room. But um, I'll say maybe to some of the folks in the room. But thank you, thank you, James, for organizing this. This is wonderful, um, and uh, and thanks to everyone still on, online. And um, I had two questions. One, just I, um, I, I so enjoyed everyone's presentations. Um, Pete, I have a question really specifically for you because I'm I'm working. Um, my work is in um, critical data studies and in feminist and um, decolonial approaches to technology. And so I really enjoyed sort of um, kind of mapping you were giving of the kind of genealogical approach um, that was part of um, the repertoire of Harry. And was really curious um, for um, for what, for one thing, which is a, a question of uh, why cybernetics wasn't part of um, that kind of you know genealogy that he was sort of mapping out. It was also, I mean, I'm kind of selfishly. Um, one of the points that I'm, I'm, I'm writing through is right now is around the, a connection to, to alternative data practices and feminist data practices contemporarily to Adams, Jane Adams, and the kind of work that was coming out of Hull House, different kinds of data applications, um, W. Du Bois, and also critical data practices that were emerging at the turn of the century that were intersectional with um, obviously marginalized populations, black and brown populations, immigrant populations really critically with the um, Hull House um, and Jane Adams tradition. And so, you know, okay, so why why not, you know, I love that that there's, there's sort of nods to, to Dewey and that cohort and the invisibilization of Adams and, um, and Du Bois and a larger cohort could have given us a different and alternative um, self-conception of ourselves, <laughs> especially in this moment where 
you know, um, contemporary media studies, communication studies is very um, intersectional with critical data studies. I think of us as one of the core pillars. And if we were, had we been able to recover that kind of practice as part of our genealogy, what would we be empowered to do now, right? We wouldn't have to argue for this as a genealogy. It would in fact be part of our identity. The other kind of question I have is sort of, I'm not a, a Kerry scholar. Um, I'm a, I'm an inheritor of mm -hmm. so many of the architectures that he's, he's built out, but I've been attending to these last two, you know, session days um, and, and meetings, sort of trying to pay attention to what kinds of um, legacies, you know, traditions, methods, toolkits Carrie leaves us with, you know, as interdisciplinary scholars, also now working through knowledge institutions that are being radically redefined in the face of data infrastructures, AI, the growth of data sciences across our own campuses, the politics that we find ourselves now grappling with. And so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of trying to think through and wanting to open up a question as well to everyone around, you know, what, in that context, what kind of legacy do you, would you underscore Carrie is sort of leaving us with? I, I heard a couple of different things, like a, a defense of interdisciplinary humanism in the face of institutions that were increasingly becoming more and more technocratic and techno-professionalized. Um, this kind of genealogical method of like uh, bringing ourselves and drawing ourselves into historical relationship with other kinds of on the ground practices and knowledge based practices, um, maybe something that we can continue to inherit. Carrie began that maybe seeded some of that work, didn't do it perfectly, as we can see from today's presentations. Thank you so much for all of that. But I'm, I'm sort of, you know, trying to think through what kinds of um, strategies, methods are we left with now that we can draw and continue from, you know, again, in this keeping in mind the sort of context of the contemporary where I think the politics of, of AI, um, big data, datafication, literally redefining our own institutions, but of course doing the kind of work as well in terms of data exploitation for vulnerable publics more broadly and set questions. Anyone want to take that? Sure, I'll take uh, yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Anita. Um, those great questions, all of them. Um, just to get started on them. So the the question of cybernetics sometimes will make it in when he talks about SRAM um, and SRAM's effort to create a general theory of communication by bringing in the Shannon Weaver model. Uh, and so it's part of this kind of conglomerate of the dominant tradition, scientific traditions. It's one of the several streams that he puts in there. Yeah. But he's clearly, Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong, It's it, that doesn't tend to be as dominant in his own thinking or his narratives about what he's up against. And like the effects tradition in kind of the Lazarsfeld uh, it is more central to him, mm -hmm. I think. So that's the first one. The second one, how cool uh, that you're going back to Du Bois and... Cooper or um, uh, Jane Adams and a Julia Cooper is also another really interesting character in that figure. I don't know if she's on your radar screen or not. Um, like, like she's considered the first intersectional black feminist. She's um, born in 18, 1863. So she's like in the same generation, um, gets a PhD at the Sorbonne, like the age of 60, you know, but has this really great book called A Voice from the South. Um, in, in 1890, and she's somebody that, you know, Du Bois should have been bringing in more. There's a small correspondence with him, but they, because of his own sexism in part, she's kind of off. But but with regard to practices and on the ground things and, and re-readings, and here to get to your question, um, I think that Carrie does open up the imaginary about what kinds of figures can be brought in. And because he was working you know, explicitly, and I'll say this more in the 80s, from a from political horizons, right? I'm making an, an intervention that's partly about liberal politics, but also about the politics of the of the um, of the discipline. And I didn't really bring in as well as I should have how those are so intertwined for him. He's always telling the bigger narrative of society and politics within which our field is is in in ingrained. But um it feels to me like we can leverage that kind of creativity in Carrie and also just mm -hmm. the compelling jargon free narratives with which we bring these characters into our conversations so that 
they could be overheard by Publix, by reading Publix, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's so important. And this is a segue to let you all come in, but I thought, Carolyn, you're, um, the stuff you were saying at the end about the plea for the university tradition and this interesting way, and I think Carrie's son, you know, talks about how Carrie both has this critique of professionalism, even as he's always doing his, his part for mm -hmm. associations and administration and things, but the kind of careerism and with that, the infiltration of lot of cultural capitalist you know, and, and and he starts to use the word neoliberal there at the very end a little bit, right? And yeah. I think so, but I'll turn it over to you all. So I think he's got a lot to offer us. And I think, Carolyn, you were starting to remind us on that. Yeah, please. I mean, you just essentially equated his interest in administration with professionalism, but I think his position would be that the faculty needs to do administration right. so that the professionals don't do the administration, which is exactly what in fact they do. That's a great so. point. And with DEI, the last thing, because I just read this and it resonated so much with me in my own campus, is that he's very aware that there's no real public sphere left on campuses. And so, like, you know, to the extent that a student newspaper might do something, but it's certainly on my campus, there used to be when I got there, a general kind of campus newspaper that was staff faculty oriented. And that's not, and so when this stuff's coming down in the university, what can we do besides either talk in our little enclaves or maybe organize, but there's no mezzo slow deliberative process, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm yeah, I've been. Yeah, just very quickly, because I know we're, out of time, but there's such good questions. And I don't think they're, that I know of great answers about Carrie and kind of big data and so on. However, I would think these pair of amazing essays that he wrote with this extraordinary undergraduate named um, John Quirk, Q-I-R-K, um, a pair of them in, in uh, the early 1970s, they both have the title like the mythos of the electronic revolution. And, um, and, and they, you know, discuss the rhetoric of technology in particular um the, the sort of they draw on leo marx the rhetoric of the technological sublime and, and it's futurism yeah and futurism and so much of that critique it's historically grounded so on could be applied to the, the titans of silicon valley and the claims being made about big data and some of that the, the only other thing i would mention is just that this this underrated or at least not widely circulated 2000 uh speech he gave is a carol lecture for nca and it's, it wasn't really widely um published you can find it a couple of places but it is it really eloquent i think it's better than the 1977 a plea for the um, university tradition it's really centered on the university and it's like pushing back against the obnoxious theme of that conference that year which was like the engaged discipline or something and <laughs> was you know his trademark beautiful um erudite kind of but but humble style um that you know pushing back against the um, incursions of the market in a way that might be yes quite common even by then but but is delivered with his his like his trademark authority and, and eloquence. So I, I would recommend those. Any other of our online guests that uh, have a quick question? I have a quick question. Angie, yeah. Really and you nice. want to come up? Really. I wish you would. <laughs> well, you're you're wearing a mask, so I don't know to what extent. Uh, <laughs> you you're wearing a mask, therefore uh, you Let's you can wear your mask in right. order. To speak, but, uh, but so my my question is not deeply theoretical; it's just curious. Uh, Carolyn could say my cohort, so I want to hear some names. Well, that's right. Although Angie Angie Hall is student after I left, I think right. Yeah. So. So when I think of my cohort, it's centered on me. <laughs> 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 the students I think I was aware. Right. So I would, I mean, uh, Linda Steiner, I was in my cohort, so she would have been a good reality check. Um, who else? Who else? Huh? Who else was in here? Yeah. Uh, Jennifer Slack. Uh, oh, wow. So I was thinking there's some people that are dead. Yeah. <laughs> um, Huh? Jolie. Jolie, absolutely. Well, except, yeah, Jolie came in as I was leaving, but Jolie's there. And, um, uh, oh, Mary Mander. Who? Was Mary Mander in your cohort? Mary Mander was my cohort. And also, um, 
I was I think of John Paul. Yeah, yeah and Ron Sands. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, and, that's, and they they would have had a very different take than I did on the receive the receiving of the cultural. But Jennifer Slack, so prestigious of the prestigious from there, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will say uh, once again, thank you to you all, to the collective that has uh, participated in this. Um, this is just kind of a prodding. This event is a kind of prodding. Maybe uh, we can exploit um, the past uh, in the present in other ways going forward. Um, perhaps more internationally too, although there were some people from outside of the United States who were participating by Zoom today. I'm most sorry as uh, somebody who loves to dine that uh, you all aren't dining with us tonight uh, to continue this conversation uh, where I feel lucky that uh, I can uh, participate in it that way. But uh, you know now who all of the participants are, uh, and you should feel free to communicate with them uh, individually or collectively. Once again, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to sign off. Uh, now, there will be a recording of this that will be posted to the website of the Institute for Communications Research. Uh, I'm hoping in the next two or three weeks uh, so you can spread the word uh, about that. Uh, thanks again. I'm going to, uh, as they say, James Hay signing off uh, right now. So uh, thank you so much again.